All right. All right. For the next interval, we are in the section hosted by the Active Inference Institute on our recent paper, Active Inference Institute and the Active Inference Ecosystem. So two short messages. First, if you're in the live chat, I'll post the link right now to the paper. And this can be more of like a conversational interval. So if you have any questions about the, um, the ecosystem or the Institute or, um, any of the stuff that we're talking about, let's make it a conversation. Uh, and then second message, if there are any co-authors on this paper who are listening to this stream, then message me on discord or post in the YouTube live chat, or just check your calendar. And um, I expect some others to join in as we go. Um, welcome, Pablo. We'll be hearing in a little bit from you as a presenter. Is there anything that you wanna just bring up or reflect on before I share the screen with the paper and we just walk through it, explore it and hear questions? Okay. I'll bring in the paper. And again, anyone watching live, please just feel free to write any questions. And uh, I'm just going to bring it so that Pablo, you're not going to see the paper. Uh, but it's it's on the live stream. Cool. Well, here we go. This is a paper that had an awesome co-authorship and even broader circles beyond the listed co-authors of collaboration and contribution. So just like everything that has happened and will happen in our work, it was massively participatory and a real learning by doing and a real enactment moment. The first version was released three days ago on Saturday, August 19th. And I'll briefly just list all the authors. First, we had the Institute as the first author so that the citation can always remain like Institute at all. Institute, comma, Active Inference Institute. And we also had Andrew Aguirre, John Boyk, Lieber Burian, Matthew Brown, RJ Corday, Scott David, David S. Douglas, Pablo Fernandez Maquiera, Daniel Friedman, Holly Grimm, Avel Gwenin Carlu, Maria Luisa Ayanico, Virginia Blue Knight, Alexandra Mikhailova, Ali Ramju, Adil Razi, Jakob Smikal, Renan Tamari, Dean Tickles, and Alex Vyatkin. So this includes everyone from founders and officers and board of directors and formal participants on different projects and different roles as volunteers or facilitators or interns, and also people who are continuing to join the fun and show up and makes the Institute and our field what it is and what it can be, what, what we want it to be. There's a table of contents for those who like to click through. And just broadly, there's going to be a preamble on active inference, but outside of the preamble, this paper is not conceptual. It is not technical. It is not philosophical, although perhaps it can be read in all of those ways, but it's quite a logistical, historical, and vision-oriented position document. After getting some of the active inferencesms out of the way in the preamble, we're going to turn to the Institute itself in terms of our vision, values, principles, and how we see moving through the challenges that we're facing right now onto the specific history of the Institute, our current organization model, 
in terms of our governance and leadership structure, as well as the institute units, the organizational units that support all the work we do. We then turn out to the community and ecosystem growth and development and go through some details of different roles that our stakeholders and participants in our space and some of the tools that we use today for managing information and message passing. We talk a little bit about our communications plan, internal and external, both sides of the blanket, and point towards some of the types of support, infrastructure, and administration that we do and that we will offer for the Active Inference ecosystem. We frame that in terms of continual deployment, continual development, and quality performance and growth evaluations across multiple scales, close with some discussion, and then provide an appendix that overviews a variety of the open source services that the Institute has provided over the past. So let's just jump in. I'm actually going to jump into the open source services first and overview them before we jump back up to the top and look at the big picture because this is really to appreciate the work of so many contributors who stepped up in the uncanny valley, in the gray zone, in the ecosystem as it's forming, as it's always forming, and really made it happen. And so many people we know are out there scribbling or taking notes or printing out papers by Friston at all or struggling and asking questions. Are there applications of this? How would this matter? Why would this matter? Is there a code version of this? How do you connect the dots between these equations? Like those are what we ask every day. And so when people can combine their regimes of attention into a synthetic intelligence outcome, then we go so far. So the first category of works that the Institute has developed are educational. We've done video live streams since the end of 2020 till now, more than 370 live streams. All live streams are curated in terms of their transcript, and we increasingly are developing automated and semi-automated methods for transcription, translation, sub-captioning, language modeling, and so on. We've had textbook groups, actually now, as of now, we have three completed cohorts of the Active Inference textbook group, the 2022 textbook. We have two courses that are being offered that are produced by external content developers. And both of these have only started in the last three, four months. First is Chris Fields's Physics as Information Processing. And second is the work spearheaded by Avel and co-organized with Kairos Research, Active Inference and the Social Sciences. Both of these are like awesome and great learning experiences. As we heard from earlier in the symposium, we're working with Sanjeev Namjoshi on his incredible textbook, although almost to call it a textbook is to either think more broadly about textbooks than one has or constrain what it really is that he's doing because it's such a unique, real research development, full spectrum effort. So I'm really looking forward to seeing how this plays out in 2024. Until then, for those who want to get involved with the testing that we do. And we've developed the Active Inference Ontology, which is a critical resource for the ecosystem. It enables us to center accessibility, rigor, and applicability across languages and settings by knowing what it is that we're talking about when we talk about Active Inference. On the research side, we've also developed the ontology in a research direction in terms of research on and about and with Active Inference itself. As far as software goes, our primary development, first off, has been the documentation and connecting the dots around some of these other incredible packages that others are developing. For example, just in this symposium, we've heard from some of the core developers and open source contributors to PyMDP, the Python package for generative modeling, as well as just a couple of minutes ago from Bert de Vries and Dmitry Begayev coming from the Julia language Rx and Fur side. And both of those are some of the leading packages for applying active inference. So we do a lot of work to connect those dots and make it more accessible. Not everybody is going to jump in with all six feet to a programming language. And what we've done with active block inference with the work of Jakob Smekal and others is to wrap generative models from active inference inside of the complex systems modeling framework, CAD-CAD. 
We've developed notation interoperability systems that actually let us pull back one layer from the implementational details themselves, for example, of Rx infer or of PyMDP, so that we can bring it halfway to where the ontology and the visualization and the natural language exists, and then use language models and other techniques to deploy it in an implementation fashion. We've developed a host of research publications. We support people in all of their different stages of their career, different seasons of life, and some really creative work has been directly produced through an institute project or somebody who knows may have gotten good ideas or good feedback just by hanging out, being in the game. And we've performed literature meta-analyses to help grapple with the scope and the quantity and the quality of what is unfolding before our eyes or before our antenna, again, even as we only so partially sample this ocean of information. We're active in standard setting and continue to develop our qualification standards for active inference that could be the basis of education, research, and professional development. We provide a variety of mentorship and facilitation service type activities, including volunteer program, internship program, distributed facilitation, and applied active inference symposia. These activities, just as all others that we're describing above, are open source, and they're also open to your participation. So if you can follow some of those suggestions by JF, time boxing and prioritize and pay attention and be active, all those fun things that he said, and you're looking to do it in a semi-structured way with a volunteer program or in a more structured way with the internship, then I heartily encourage people to get involved, act now. And in terms of governance activity, we have a scientific advisory board as well as a board of directors. And together with the officers, those groups constitute the formal governance structure of the Institute, but there's also so much more to it. And we look forward to understanding what ecosystem governance can look like in the coming years. So welcome, Dean. I just summarized the, the work itself. That was the pre preamble. And now if you'd like to say hi, you are Pablo before we jump into more sections of the paper or look at more questions that people have asked. How goes it or what was your experience of working with the paper or what brings you on to this strange stream at this opportune time? Uh, basically why I'm here is because I, uh, for the first time, even as, as a um, acting board member with, with the Institute, I was able to get a better sense of the kind of depth that we aspire to. And I'm not sure whether or not we are going to be, I, I really don't know what directions we're going to be going in the next coming months, weeks, years, etc. But I have a better sense now as a result of participating in this development exercise uh, of what the potential is that I probably had at any time. And I've been with the Active Inference Institute for a couple of years. So that's saying something. I think we had to get to this point to be able to write this document. And now it's it's acting as a bit of a springboard. Now, which, which way we go and how we land, I'm not still certain about what that looks like. But I think that's part of what the really interesting thing is. Um, we seem to have moved away from the dock, and now the real journey begins. So that's my take on it so far. Moving away from the dock, D-O-C-K, pushing off, using it as a springboard, continuing the adventure, leaving the preprint behind, continuing to version it as a living document, and yep. also wayfinding outside of the dock. Pablo? Oh, wait, I don't hear you yet, Pablo. Sorry, oh, I was mute. <laughs> Hello. Um, it, it was a great experience to go through the document and, and review it and reread it and thinking about it. Actually, it's a living document, which is super exciting. And I keep taking notes and, and hopefully uh, act on it in the future. 
and uh, and it's been a super uh, experience to to find so many people with uh, the same um, some interest, same interest, and some values that I really think are going to be the basis of uh, organizations on the future. So I think we are doing something very cool here. Cool. All right. Well, let's just walk through some of the sections in the 25 minutes that we have. Um, again, the paper is being shown on the stream, but, but Dean and probably don't see it. So we kicked off with a preamble. We wanted to introduce Octave Inference as briefly as we could and point towards the fundamental first principles and physics-based nature of Octave Inference and initially point towards its integrative capacity in principle. And then in the second paragraph, there's about 104 citations in this paragraph. And that's where it's really only a sampling of the domains, 21 domains here. So it's a place where we can point to where is active inference being applied or how is active inference being applied or how is it different or better than another approach in a given setting, which isn't to say that it does everything in all settings for all people at all times and all of that. But this is to say that here's where one can look to find out more and even just building this and bringing it all together, we we see so many opportunities for epistemic resources in the ecosystem and having real-time literature analyses and all these kinds of services that we want to provide. Starting on page five, we turn to the Institute itself. And we write, as of August 2023, the Active Inference Institute is a registered nonprofit organization tasked with identifying, establishing, and managing the sustainable implementation of administrative and governance functions to give components of the Active Inference ecosystem coherent forms and reliable channels of communication. Two, publishing and licensing protocols that establish open and fair use and effective dissemination of community products within and beyond the ecosystem. Three, services at the scale of individual humans and the community at large so that stability is protected while risk and uncertainty are minimized within the ecosystem and four organization and operation of cyber and cognitive security systems that ensure productivity inclusivity accessibility and safety in discourse in collaboration figure one gives a graphical representation just one of how we are now and for those who want to dig more check out the 2022 active inference textbook where you'll also find a golden ring and we kind of took that graphical motif and ran with it had a lot of fun and a lot of interpretations there so just here looking at figure one dean or pablo just want to add anything Yeah, Dean. So one thing about the building of this document um, with a whole bunch of authors, uh, it's often not made explicit, but there are two aspects to learning about yourself. One is to actually throw some stuff down on paper because you believe certain things need to be included. And then the second part is the consolidation process. And I think one of the most interesting co consolidation processes was this graphic, because I think what, what it does is it tries to condense as, as much as possible and yet still remain coherent around what the relational aspects that we are trying to make available are as opposed to this is what we've captured now look look what our graphic designer came up with so if you've had a chance to kind of look at this and really analyze it and think about the layers and think about okay so what's the background here what's the foreground does this representation allow for a swapping 
Can we have things that appear to be background or, you know, fundamental basis stuff that could actually be things that we are addressing in the moment versus those things which we look at as particulars that in fact are generalities. So again, it's one of those things, it's, I, I don't know, Daniel probably knows whether it's a Where's Waldo thing or, you know, some sort of uh, artist that they came up with some strange twist on things. But, but the bottom line is spend a few minutes, have a look, because you'll want to go through your own building of what these relationships are. And you'll also want to be able to consolidate. If you, I wasn't there when this representation was built, but I do know that I want to be able to both look at it, do a comparative analysis to what I think the Institute should be, and then be able to consolidate. Awesome. Yeah, just a few notes on this and to give a visual overview, since it may be clearer to see this, then go through the prose that essentially describes it as much later on. The golden ring represents the active inference ecosystem. And I think we could talk about golden rings for a long time to come. But coming in from the ecosystem on the bottom, bottom for the reader, not from the other side of the table, are the projects. And all the projects are participatory endeavors. They're happening behind, on, and in front of the golden ring, depending on how you look at it. And that is the appendix and all of those different projects that we talked about and all of the iterations and new threads that I know that we're going to see in an hour and I know that we're going to see in a month and in a year and in a century. And those projects are being supported through two units, kind of like a department, but an organizational unit, one centered on education and one centered on research. The education unit is called EduActive, and the research unit is called Reinference. So right there, you kind of have active inference, in case that wasn't clear. Coming from the institute scale, supporting the unit scale are a variety of functions such as funding and partnerships, communications, and hierarchical processes, such as the construction of enabling systems. And at the institute scale, other than administrative functions, we have the officers, the day-to-day -day operators of the work, the board of directors, which is the formal governing body, and the scientific advisory board, where we really want to call out broadly and have people who may have or may have not thought that they would find themselves in a scientific advisory board, for example, in 2024, this is your invitation and we really want to have a vibrant scientific advisory board who serves liaison type roles with different sectors and just gives periodic, super valuable, high leverage insight. And then I guess, depending on how you think about it, as all things, we have just a few terms. They don't just represent bricks in the wall, but it's more of like the, the fibers we weave. And some of these, are already things that we do every day. Courses, educational groups, events, live streams, ontology, research. Others of these are things that we know will be coming into place in the coming years. And we know that the tapestry is just gonna continue to expand. So it's really exciting. On page six, we have another figure. And this is just another way to represent some of the functions that we serve in the ecosystem. This isn't the only or the final or a fixed representation of the functions that we have or the only way to slice and dice or any of that, but just to connect some of the dots between the functions that we do and want to serve for the ecosystem. So starting from the broadest, let's just say where the listener is, where you are right now is in the space of awareness and that happens through communication. Some people who become aware through a search or a language model or a video suggestion or a friend or happenstance or synchronicity or however, some fraction of the aware will pursue education. And about education, we have and will continue to produce the materials, documentation, ontology courses, live streams, and so on. 
education is produced and rests upon a commons. It's an epistemic commons. It's a verified information environment. And that is really the space, the wildlife preserve, as I know Dean likes to refer to it, not jokingly at all. And underneath the commons is the support that does sit between a participatory commons and a formal governing kernel. That support in the coming years may go many directions, but we know it's going to involve all of our favorite things like hardware, software, information, behavior, narrative, and more. And then we have the regular institute scale governance, partnership, sponsor, and donor relationships such that we can first find a type of stability or sustainability and then more actively play a regenerative role in our ecosystem. We want to dispense micro grants to people and we want to explore paid internships and be able to meet people where they are in their active inference journey. And things have been happening to that end and through many means since 2021. On page six, Pablo or Dean want to add any thoughts? I'm super excited about the governance, the education, and the game and tools. <laughs> In an hour, we're going to see the first active inference game. This is very fun. Um, on seven, we describe our vision, our values, and our principles. And just to read the top level on the values and principles, they are active inference and exploration, integrity and inclusivity, dynamic internal modeling, anticipatory behavior, and continuous development. On page eight, we talk about some priorities and challenge areas. These are challenges across multiple scales. They're challenges that individual people face in their journey to learn and apply in so many different backgrounds. These are challenges of national interest. These are challenges of global emergency as well. These challenges are educational in nature, for example, related to scientific literacy and workforce development and just general professionalization in changing times. On the research side, there are some priorities and challenge areas related to the fundamentals of cognitive science and grounding the cognitive science in physics, getting that integrative first principles framework that we expect and prefer. About information science and diverse intelligences, things are faster and different than they have been. An active inference is perfectly poised for sense making and decision making in that space. User experience, accessibility, and socio technical design. This is a major open question across different settings, so it's not uniquely held to the Institute. However, we really do believe and really will commit to exploring new kinds of ergonomics and onboardings and experience so that we can come through and be how we want to be from the first time somebody enters the game where we can highlight accessibility, meeting people in the language that they prefer to listen to and speak at the language in computer language or at the math level that reflects somebody's preference in that moment, as well as being able to use augmented and synthetic intelligence systems to ramp up and even push the frontier of what augmented people and other kinds of collective intelligence systems can do. Cyber and cognitive security. These also are broader topics. We've worked on these topics from an active inference perspective. Many have, and we think that this is going to become increasingly relevant as things do become more and more challenging and uncertain in certain ways out there. Scaling the active inference ecosystem. 
we've heard about this from the narrow and technical side. We had estimates of the computational complexity of sophisticated inference about how many computer operations have to happen for a given calculation to play out. And that's sometimes called scaling active inference. Like, okay, it took one minute on one gigabyte of data. So how many minutes is it gonna take on this computer with this much data? Scaling the active inference ecosystem though is a broader question. And that's where we come to more of the social fabric and the real sense of belonging that we all want to have and co-create and provide for others in the ecosystem. And so this kind of scaling is really transdisciplinary. It's really skin in the game. It's as real as it gets. And applying active inference, some applications we've heard from today, some applications are cited in the early pages of this paper and more and more come through every day and we support at the Institute various applications of active inference. Dean, what can you add in there? Okay, my mute is off. Good. So, so here's, here's, a, here's something that never came up in the writing of the document, but I think it's kind of interesting. And I'm curious what you guys have to think about this. 175 years ago, an institution came and formed together. It's called the Smithsonian Institute. Now, I don't know if 175 years from this conversation today, there'll be the equivalent of whatever the Active Inference Institute is 175 years forward. But I think it's okay to start thinking in those terms. It doesn't mean that we follow in their footsteps necessarily. But I think it means that we have a long-term view and that the things that we write about ourselves now have some shelf life, have some real sense of, well, we can't, there are things that we can and we cannot change. But if you look at this, if you look at the front page, the landing page of the Smithsonian Institute, the first thing that they say is welcome, which is what we say about the Active Inference Institute. And then they say the Smithsonian Institution is the world's largest museum, education, and research complex. We are a community of learning and an opener of doors. Join us on a voyage of discovery. So in, in three sentences, they kind of sum themselves up. What, what's the formula for not just existing for 175 years, but being a force? And I think, again, um, Daniel, whatever you decide to highlight in the document today, what I think we're really trying to do is say, do the words that we put out now, will they continue to resonate with people for decades to come? And again, I don't want to sound all hand wavy, but I want to hold up an example of a, of a place that really did set itself up to be something that people could return to again and again and again. And I don't think there's anything wrong with aspiring to having that kind of place, that kind of respect. And I think that the things that you're pointing to right now, hopefully, set the set the the you know the we're preparing properly. So that's what I'm that's what I'm taking away at this point. We know about that preparation measurement cycle. From Chris Fields, don't we? Yeah. We go on definitely. to talk a little. Oh, yeah, please, Pablo. Go <laughs> no, no, definitely. I completely agree. I've been thinking about that uh, for a long time. Uh, you, you want to build and act uh, for the best of the future. And I think to reflect that on the paper, it's super important. So. Yeah, definitely up to do that. <laughs> yeah. Way ahead, we describe some paths that we want to take, but and and the history of the Institute, we describe our origins, but I actually wanted to come to, to figure three and four on page 11 to speak to building. One of the most amazing and encouraging things has been the all ages, all time zone, active, build, contribute, mindset an earlier version of myself i might have thought like hmm people who do variational bayesian methods in machine learning 
they're going to have no issue onboarding to active inference. It's just going to be like as simple as saying, yeah, it's a variational Bayesian model with action. So it's just signal processing on the inbound. It's just control theory on the outbound. But if you're familiar with variational Bayes and variational free energy, this isn't changing it that much. Oh yeah, we use a particular partition and it's related to the free energy principle, but don't worry too much, you'll get there. I thought that that would be the path for so, so many. And future analyses will reveal what they do or don't reveal. But what we found in our enacted work as it really played out that there was inclusion and unique contributions to conversations ranging from philosophy of science to fundamentals of statistics and meta science and the role of quantitative studies and social systems, all these amazing topics and people who just scampered so rapidly through the prerequisite, what, what could be seen as prerequisite from a disciplinary perspective was beat, was facilitated by the recognition that one was already in the space and in the way that they needed to be, to be an active inference. And that was not written out before. And even now the traces are barely recorded, but it will become to be understood more fully. And to your point, Daniel, um, I think, especially what the pie chart shows, is the actual spectrum aspect of this. So I know that right now that, that maybe the neuroscience and the psychology piece take up a bigger portion, but I think one of the things that we're trying to promote is the idea that um, you can come from just about any background as opposed to, oh, all, all paths lead to, if, like, as you said, an earlier version of you said, oh, okay, well, I can see where everything is going to, where the confluence is going to. No, I think what this, dis this demonstrates is that it's actually becoming more distributed the longer we, we continue to, to exist. Yeah, this figure... Of course, I'm super happy with everything that we were able to do, but this figure is like almost a little bit like a um, like a, a paper target that we're just going to blow out later because it was a fraction of only people who had formal affiliations listed, which means only people for whom we had done full literature-based polling of their information. So it, it doesn't even represent the actual participation profile this is more like the invitation list for live streams. So we are going to see another long, ta a long tail that covers the part that's not the long tail, I believe. Um, the rest of the paper continues along. Possibilities, challenges, next steps, more about the Institute organization various other pieces of information that potentially eager stakeholders or participants or donors or liaisons or other people would like to learn more about. It's there to engage with. We want people to hop into our Discord and continue the conversation or email us or otherwise get involved. It's why we called this symposium enacting ecosystems of shared intelligence at the of course relevant suggestion of carl friston because we really do want to enact it so if you feel like you're on the sideline waiting to jump in or you're on the beach and people are out there surfing the 100 foot wave then maybe it's time to get more involved so i will leave the closing word first to dean then pablo and then we'll go to Raf's presentation. Well, just real quick, I, again, if you have, if you want a consolidated document that speaks to the now, but also points to a direction that we, none of us really know is, is certain, but is also really exciting, have a look at the doc.
Pablo? Um, yeah, I'm here uh, to make sure that I act as one of those people of all backgrounds and perspectives that has taken advantage through one year of learning and acting uh, on this institute. And hopefully see you in one hour. So thank you and have fun. <laughs> Thanks, Dean. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you, Dean. Thank you, Pablo. Welcome, Raf. Also, co-author on the paper. So, how are you doing? Uh, I'm good. What about you? Pretty good. Other than this brief interval of white light, I'm just